All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We run 50 plus broadcasts every month that you can check out on exploringbytheseat.com, featuring scientists and explorers from around the world. Today is particularly exciting for us. Today is the first time we've ever gone all in on World Lemur Day. So October 30th, World Lemur Day, and this is our fifth of five Five presentations featuring lemur science and conservation from around the world. We started the day in Madagascar with Mami Razafitsalama, the executive director in country of Planet Madagascar. You can check out information of them on the bottom. Then we went to Dr. Carrie Ann McGugan, author of Chasing Lemurs, telling her own personal story of exploration in the northwest of Madagascar. We went over to the Duke Lemur Center and heard about uh, the lemur forest that they have there, getting, uh, getting a chance to showcase some amazing creatures uh, live in the forest in North Carolina. And just a couple hours ago, we finished up with the the Toronto Zoo, where we got to learn from Sonia, the lemur keeper at the zoo, and Dr. Travis Steffens about their ring-tailed lemurs. Today's wrap-up presentation is a mix of all of this and more. So we are joined live today by members of a huge variety of organizations working towards lemur conservation around the world. We've got Planet Madagascar, the Duke Lemur Center, University of Toronto Scarborough Campus, and the Toronto Zoo. So thank you so, so much to all our live and YouTube groups for joining in today. We look very forward to your questions, and I hope this is a very insightful and fun discussion for you. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to CEO of the Toronto Zoo, Dolph DeYoung, who's going to kick us off with an intro message. Dolph, thank you so, so much for joining us. Demute your mic, guys, and you'll be good to go. Good afternoon, Jesse, and good afternoon to all of you watching, and thanks for joining us on Lemur Day. It's certainly a fun and amazing day, and we're so grateful to work with all our partners on this important cause. Before we get too much further, I just want to acknowledge that the land we're on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and now is the home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed by various Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. So today is incredibly exciting. Jesse talked about the number of partners that have come together and are working together to help raise awareness of the challenges lemurs are facing. And we're excited to be here with Travis and also with one of our really important fellow anchor institutions here on the east side of Toronto, uh, the University of Toronto Scarborough. We have a really close partnership with them, a great relationship working together to build critical thinking and awareness. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Wisdom Tetley to get the show going. Over to you, Wisdom. Thanks, Dolph, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome um, to everyone who's joining us this afternoon for the inaugural University of Toronto Scarborough and Toronto Zoo Discussion Series. My name uh, is Wisdom KJ, and I have the privilege of serving as uh, Vice President of the University of Toronto and Principal of the University of Toronto Scarborough. I want to extend my sincere thanks to all our friends at the zoo and at the university for all the hard work that has gone into preparation for today's talks. And I want to congratulate everyone uh, of you on being part of what I understand has been a wonderful day of programming, starting from Madagascar and traversing the globe and up to this point here in Toronto. And on behalf of the University of Toronto Scarborough, it's my pleasure to help kick off uh, the first of what would be an engaging and enlightening set of uh, discussion series uh, that we've worked on together. And they're just one of a set of exciting initiatives that we're working on together as partners. And the two institutions have found common purpose on a number of issues that are very dear to the hearts of uh, members of our community uh, and, and are critical to the future of our planet. Uh, and so some of you may be aware that we recently announced a partnership that is centered around our shared commitment to education and research with priorities in the areas of conservation and biodiversity, environmental sustainability and innovation. Now, a few highlights of this partnership are worth mentioning. We are intent on establishing an institute for conservation and biodiversity research that would generate and share knowledge in support of wildlife and habitat conservation. 
We also are planning new courses that would leverage the expertise of the faculties of um, the University of uh, Toronto Scarborough, as well as the expertise of our partners uh, at the zoo. And these would allow us to maximize uh, learning experiences based on the coming together of different uh, experts working collaboratively to pursue a shared vision. And this partnership also would allow for experiential learning opportunities for our students who would be able to uh, engage with the work going on at the zoo as interns on co-op placements, uh, seasonal employment opportunities are part of this. And uh, you know, importantly, we hope that it'll engender volunteer spirit and activities amongst our students. So the topic of today's discussion, which focuses on current and future efforts at Lima Conservation, complements this overall objective and uh, is a good start to our aspirations for this very valuable partnership. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining us today for uh, these discussions. And please enjoy the talks. And I look forward to seeing you at future versions of this series. So back to you. Thank you so, so much, Wisdom, for a beautiful introduction to today's talk uh, and presentations. I want to stress as a University of Toronto former student myself and as someone who volunteered at the Toronto Zoo that it's a really exciting opportunity to see these great organizations partner together to work towards conservation. And, you know, my personal educational journey uh, was made possible because of the efforts of those two organizations. So with programs like this, uh, both today and in the future, I'm excited to see how we can inspire more youth of all ages to take part and really take meaningful action for conservation. So really briefly, before we dive in with one specific talk, I want to give a quick shout out to all our speakers today. So we're joined by Dr. Travis Stevens, Dr. James Herrera, and Dr. Julie uh, Tykrobe. Uh, I'll get, bring them all on the screen for a second so you can just say a quick hello to all of them. Um, and we'll be bringing them in one by one, doing little bits of intros for everybody uh, to say hi in the coming minutes. Uh, but we're going to begin today with Dr. Travis Stephens. So he is the Executive Director of Planet Madagascar. As I said, we started our day in Madagascar with the income country director. And now I'm really excited to hear from Travis as he shares a little bit about the uh, organization Planet Madagascar, what they do, and how you can take part at home. So Travis, thank you so much for joining us and uh, take us away. Hello, hello. I'm just sharing my screen now, just making sure it works. Travis, yeah, it works perfectly, but we want to unmute your mic on your second camera. I know we got two cameras on you right now. <laughs> I'll let you know when you're all good to go on your uh, phone, and then we'll bring that up for everybody. Uh, nope, you're muted on both right now. <laughs> Half the fun of digital presentations. There you go, Travis. Perfect. Yep, go for it. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to, uh, and to bring Planet Madagascar here at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, we've had a fantastic partnership with them for the last few years, and they've been integral into helping us do some of the conservation work we do in Madagascar. I just want to talk a little bit about the work we do. Planet Madagascar focuses on the three C's of conservation. This is the basics of conservation, community, and communication. We are, in our, one of our most important projects is protecting forests from fire. Uh, you can see here a fire break that we were building with a fire off in the distance. This is an important part of, uh, of the conservation we do because that fire impacts a lot of the forests that lemurs live in. We also work on conservation projects surrounding forest restoration. And uh, we have a women's cooperative that we partnership that helps us build more and better community relations. And we work with children's groups and adults to do education uh, around Madagascar, especially around the national park that we work in. And why do we do this? We're doing this to protect the lemurs that are that are endangered in the area we work. There's eight species of lemurs. Uh, it might be hard to see from the slide here, but there's actually one missing. We have some small mouse lemurs. We have mongoose lemur, beautiful cockerel shapaka, the brown lemur, woolly lemur, and the sportive lemur. What's missing from the slide is the uh, 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 is a fat-tailed dwarf lemur. And I mentioned fire is integral to, to the, the area that we work in. Well, the area that we work in is a dry deciduous forest that is impacted by fire on a, in, in a natural basis. But these fires have increased with human encroachment. And those fires, when they burn out of control, will burn down the lemur forest. 
So we have teams of people maintaining a network of 15 kilometers of fire break that they build by hand, and they do this every year. And these are important because as fires come, this is a photo I showed you earlier, they will hit this fire break, and the fire break will stop the fire from continuing into the forest. We also will back burn some of these fire breaks, so actually we'll use fire to fight fire. So we'll bring down the fuel load of the of the of the area by by, by bringing fire through, so that after uh, a number of years there won't be a massive fire that comes into the area impacting the forest. The forest restoration project has been very successful. We just started it, but we've already put in over forty five thousand uh, trees into the ground. And this year we plan to put in another 30,000 and we're hoping to get up to 50,000 a year from here on in. Here's one of the, one of the three nurseries that we operate, but we built a fourth nursery that we, we, uh, we donated to a women's cooperative. And we do this all with manual labor and, and, uh, and uh, very little technology. It's done by people carrying these seedlings by hand or on the back of ox carts all the way to the plantation zone where we plant these plants in hopes of building more lemur cores. And this is done with uh, just a lot of hard work. Now where the Toronto Zoo comes in is they actually have funded us, uh, given us an opportunity with sustainable funding so that we can hire a single individual who helps us uh, full time work to find lemurs in the forest near the community he works in and uh, or he lives in. And this is Jean-Paul here, I've, I've circled him. He's, uh, he has many different faces. Sometimes he's quite serious, sometimes he's uh, uh, kind of a goof. Uh, but he's one of the hardest working people I know. But when I asked him if he was interested in working for the Toronto Zoo as, a, as a, someone who, who tracks lemurs and gets to know the lemurs, he said it would be one of the proudest things he could do would be to, to work with his, the, 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 the animals in the, in the community that he actually lives in. So he was very excited about that. So I want to thank the Toronto Zoo for, for offering that funding, because without which we couldn't offer sustainable employment like this and helping conserve lemurs. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Travis. What a fantastic presentation and highlighting Jean-Paul, uh, a really uh, an incredible individual. And again, part of the Planet Madagascar team, which you guys can all check out at planetmadagascar.org in the bottom of your screen. So with that, I want to take us to our second speaker. So we are joined live uh, by the director of the Sava Conservation Project Coordinating uh, Coordinator at the Duke Lemur Center, Dr. James Herrera. He's going to speak a little bit about the amazing work that they do. Again, another organization that we featured many times here on Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. So James, do you mute your microphone? Come on in, and we'd love to hear your story about lemur conservation. Hi, everyone, and thank you all for having me. Uh, it's a really uh, big honor to be able to speak uh, with, with such a huge group, uh, you know, even virtually, and share about what the Duke Lemur Center is uh, doing for conservation in Madagascar. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and hope for the best. Can you see that all right? Perfect. You're good to go. Great. So the focus of my talk today will be about how partnerships are really fundamental for lemur conservation, especially the partnerships with the local communities like Travis was just describing. So I'm excited to be able to take you on a quick journey to Madagascar uh, and I'll spare you the 48 hours of flying and the six hours of hiking up the mountain to get to this beautiful spot, which is high up in Maro Jaji National Park. It's one of the national parks in the Sava region, which is uh, northeastern Madagascar. And these mountains are just covered in rainforest and jungle. And in those jungles are the lemurs, like these silky shifakas, which are uh, really only found in this part of Madagascar. So not only are they only found in Madagascar, but in just one unique pocket. And so Madagascar, as you've probably already heard by now, is an island off the southeast coast of, Mad of Africa. Um, and it's about the size of the state of Texas or the country of France. So it's actually very large. The Duke Lemur Center has our uh, Sava conservation projects up here in the northeast. And, uh, you know, the best uh, guess we have about how lemurs actually got to Madagascar is by rafting, probably from Africa, like 50 million years ago. And it might seem kind of crazy, but it turns out that we, we've actually observed uh, species alive today, like lizards and iguanas that get shipped out on islands of vegetation and storms and end up moving around on different islands. So yeah, maybe it could, could be possible. 
So once they got there, they diversified into over a hundred different species. And they range in size from the smallest mouse lemurs, 30 grams fitting in the palm of your hand. And they scurry around at night eating insects and their uh, dwarf lemurs there eating uh, flowers and fruits. And then they range all the way up to the largest living lemurs, the Indri, which is about 10 kilos or 22 pounds, like a medium sized dog. Some of these lemurs are so specialized on eating uh, just things like bamboo that they're really kind of astonishing. We still don't understand how they eat these uh, bamboos. And of course, some of the most famous lemurs like the Indri are like a flagship species. They represent the rainforest and the conservation priorities in Madagascar. So by protecting species like lemurs, we can also protect um, other species that they coexist with. And these lemurs really are uh, just fascinating to watch. We've had really great opportunities to observe them in their natural habitat. Here the silky shifaka are grooming and nuzzling as they uh, kind of wind down and get ready to sleep for the evening. Here the white fronted brown lemur is exhibiting how these uh, males have a white uh, fluffy face while females actually have just uh, black hair on their heads. Um, and you know, just a diversity of species that they're always very curious when they see us coming. Here's those bamboo lemurs I was mentioning doing what they do best, uh, eating bamboo. And you know, that diet is not very, uh, you know, full of energy. So they spend a lot of time just kind of hanging out and grooming each other. There's nocturnal species that if you're lucky, you can find them during the day, like this little lepa lemur or sportive lemur. They sleep in the tree holes, but if you disturb them, they might just peek out to see what you're up to. And the dwarf lemurs and mouse lemurs that are out at night, they're really like squirrel sized or literally mouse sized animals that are just a, you know, a real treat to be able to find because they can be so elusive. Now, lemurs are rainforest, and especially the rainforest species, they're really dependent on forest. And so habitat loss is one of the things that's most threatening to their, to their survival. So if we look at just the Sava region, which is marked here in red, you can see the extent of forest cover back in 1950, all this green. And then, you know, we watch as the forest kind of contracts and gets fragmented through the 1970s and until more recently around 2017. In fact, 20% of the forest cover uh, has been lost in the Sava region just between 2000 and 2017. So this is what's the main cause of, of lemur threats. Uh, and this is mostly due to slash and burn or shifting agriculture. Farmers who are using, you know, just kind of axes and machetes to clear a piece of vegetation and burn it in preparation for farming. They also use fire as Travis just described to clear pastures for grazing their cattle. And sometimes these fires just get out of control like, uh, like Travis was explaining, and they get into the forest and can burn the forest down. But it's not just because they want to burn the forest, they don't like forests, it's because they're trying to grow their crops. So here you can see a, a Malagasy mother with her children as she's tending her most important crops, which are the rice, beans, uh, corn, cassava. These are the staples, and most of the farmers are uh, growing just enough for their families to eat. So it leads to this kind of mosaic environment where you've got patches of, of land that are being farmed in different kind of stages. And you can see up here, you know, patches of forest that remain. And this tree line here, that's the boundary of a national park. And this is the interface where the Duke Lemur Center really tries to um, collaborate closely with those communities that are using the land to find the sustainable uh, goals that we're all trying to achieve. So I work for the, I'm the program coordinator for the Duke Lemur Center Saba Conservation Program. And we take a community-based approach to conservation. We spend a lot of time doing focus groups and stakeholder interviews with the local communities to understand the challenges they face, the goals they have, and the solutions they envision. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews to do research about socioeconomics, health, uh, perceptions about the environment and their agricultural practices. And we partner very closely with a lot of different actors, but especially the university in the region. Um, we see a really vibrant and motivated group of staff, teachers, students, including, for example, the director, Christoph Manzari Bay. He has a PhD in ecological restoration, so he really has conservation at heart. Fulgence, uh, who's a herpetologist, you know, focusing on the chameleons and reptiles and uh, frogs. And 
There's Evra, who's an ecotourism guru. And of course, uh, Tori Yen, who's an agriculture specialist. And so these folks have really helped uh, to develop new projects like in sustainable agriculture. So we've also held training with international um, uh, uh, consultation from Terra Firma International, which is a group to, to, to really learn more about sustainable agriculture. And here we are collaborating with the farmers and the students from the university to make um, sustainable home gardens. And working closely with local women, as Travis mentioned, we really have to empower women to have a bigger um, and stronger say in their communities. Um, and they're really excited by this because here they are gathering local materials that are free and all around them. You know, Lily showing off some of the ash and char from their cooking fires, which can help to bring these soils to life. And they're using local compost that they've made themselves. And it's also an opportunity for kids and uh, the other parents in the neighborhood to see how people can use the resources all around them in a new way. And it's really, really exciting to see people taking off with this and the progress they're making. Um, and so uh, we really try to focus on nutrient dense vegetable crops, uh, but also trees. So as Travis was pointing out, you know, reforestation is a really important part of the conservation of Madagascar. But it's, uh, it's also good to work with the farmers on this because these trees in the farming landscape can really be productive for the farmer as well. So we're focusing on cash crops like coffee. And here are Christoph and one of the students who demonstrated the proper plant care and maintenance. Um, and so it's really kind of at the interface of these three concepts, the biodiversity conservation, the local partnerships, and these place-based approaches to uh, development where we see the sustainable development goals for, uh, you know, for the future. And so just to give you a quick uh, recap about the communities we're reaching, uh, we've trained about 100 farmers in the last year and 40% of them have already adopted the methods that they learned in the workshops. 50% of those are women like Madame Angel here who turned a small uh, corner of her backyard into a really productive uh, and diverse farm. Uh, we have partnered with schools to create fish farms so they can do farm-raised fishing and they've gathered thir 13 kilos of fish just in the last year. Uh, planted over 2,000 trees and we've got plants to plant 20,000 more in 2021. Uh, we've delivered over 300 fuel efficient stoves to families in the region because 80% or more of families still cook and heat their homes with uh, firewood or charcoal. So these stoves are much more efficient. They save the, the families a lot in terms of charcoal and um, their family budget. We've uh, partnered with the university and held workshops with over 50 Malagasy students, and including here where we did a field ecology workshop in the national park. And over 80 Duke students over the years have participated in these events. So we're really, uh, it's great to have such a diverse uh, group of actors involved. And we couldn't do it without the conservation coordinator, Charlie Welsh, and project coordinator, Lantu Anjian Anjasana, uh, Everard Benasuavina, and Tori and Robin Monansua. The whole CURSA team, I, I wish I had time to name everyone. And of course, the students who have been doing a lot of the uh, research and the um, development work with us. Um, and the sponsorship that makes this work possible. So thank you all very much. James, thank you so much. Uh, again, you touched upon a lot of the points that Travis touched upon, and I love highlighting it in conservation programs, and especially when it comes to Madagascar and lemurs. The idea of incorporating the local community, building up uh, women's groups, uh, incorporating youth that the whole next generation has seen and understands what's going on in the of it. So I really, really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Awesome. All right. A couple quick notes before we uh, uh, go on to our next speaker. One, uh, James mentioned something called the injury. And so for me, uh, there are individual interactions with nature are what really drove me to be interested in the natural world and to want to conserve it. So I encourage every single student who's watching today, when you're done this broadcast, go on YouTube, listen to the call of the injury. It's one of the most hauntingly beautiful things in all of nature. Uh, and if it doesn't drive you to want to conserve lemurs, I don't know what will. So check that out. 
So for our next speaker, um, I love the comments coming in on YouTube. So our, our next speaker, I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Tykrobe. So Dr. Julie Tykrobe, uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. She's going to share her story in a minute, but I just want to say, Julie, uh, we have your students who are literally outside of class hour, don't need to be here, and are coming on YouTube to say how fantastic they are, and they want to listen to you talk more, which I don't think there could be a better affirmation of what you're doing than that. So I'm excited to hear from you because of their, uh, their excitement, and I look very forward to you sharing a, a little bit of a broader perspective on primate conservation generally. So thank you so much, Dr. Tykrobe, and take us away. Thanks so much, Jesse. And man, yeah, my students, wow, they must be aiming for A's. I'm, I'm pretty impressed, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to share my, my talk here to get us started. All right, I think this is going to work. So far, so good. We're just killing it with these talks so far. All right. I might be a little bit more long-winded as I tend to be. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here for Lemur Day. I'm a primate behavioral ecologist um, in the anthropology department at University of Toronto Scarborough. And I have done projects um, on lemurs in the past, but actually my main research is in sub-Saharan Africa. So I've studied these three different monkey species pictured here for many years. Um, the one on the left, the white-thighed colobus, I studied for about 10 years during my master's and PhD in Ghana in West Africa. And then the other two species here, the vervet monkeys and the Ruanzori Angolan colobus, I study them currently for about the last eight years um, in East Africa in Uganda. Um, so I'm just gonna, you know, have a talk that's a little bit broader and it's going to take us beyond Madagascar. So the primate family tree is pretty big, and although lemurs, which are shown here at the top, are a really important part of it, today I just want to discuss the wide diversity of living primates and talk about the state of their populations. So primates are distributed across the tropics and even into more temperate areas in North Africa, South Africa, China, and Japan. So I'll just show you a heat map of the global biodiversity of primates. And you can see it's particularly great in the areas shown in yellow, orange, and red. So primates are present in 90 countries, but four countries contain two thirds of all primate species. So that's Madagascar, Brazil, Indonesia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now the state of primate conservation, unfortunately, is not great. So there are about 504 species of primates approximately 60% of which are threatened with extinction and approximately 75% of which have declining populations. And this is all due to growing anthropogenic pressures on their habitats. So because primates are largely an arboreal or tree dwelling order of animals, anything that destroys forests or fragments forests have an, has a negative effect on their populations. So this looks a little bit scary, but I'll just explain what's going on here. So what you see in red, these numbers here, these are the numbers of primates, primate species in these geographic areas. And then down here, these graphs will show you the percent of species in those areas that are threatened in green and the percent of populations declining in red. So as you can see, Madagascar and Asia have the greatest number of species threatened and the greatest numbers of populations declining. And in Asia, this is particularly because of the very large human population there. The first primate to go extinct actually um, in modern times, so in the last 350 years or so, is actually a red colobus species. This is Miss Waldron's red colobus, which has not been spotted since 1978. Um, and that's because they live in the Upper Guinea forests of West Africa, an area that um, is hunted very intensively for human consumption. Um, of all wildlife, including primates. So the IUCN's um, Species Survival Commission, the primate specialist group, is charged with determining how primate populations are doing. And every two years, they evaluate the 25 most endangered primate species. And I'm sad to say that they could switch out those 25 with another 25 just as easily with just as high a level of endangerment. So what I wanna to do today is just go through a few of these primates that are on the current list of the top 25 most endangered, just to, to show you how amazing they are. So unfortunately, my past study species, white side colobus, has been on the last two um, lists of the top 25 most endangered. 
So habitat destruction and hunting in the geographic range of this species has led to a highly fragmented population and only about 1,200 individuals remaining. The only stronghold of this species now is the population that I actually studied for my master's and my PhD at the Boa Bigafema Monkey Sanctuary in Ghana, where there are about 370 monkeys left. Now, the only reason these colobus survive in these forest fragments um, is that the colobus, as well as a local Mona monkey species, are important in the traditional religion at the site. So Boa Bingfema is a sacred grove, and there are shrines to the two monkey species. Um, and the monkeys are thought to be children of the local gods and to bring prosperity to the area. So pictured here, um, on the left is the fetish priest of Boa Bing, Nana Amwa. And in this picture, he's pouring libations to the colobus god, Daworo, and he's asking for the success of our research project. So as you can see at this picture of the monkeys, um, the infants in this species are born pure white, and this ne neonatal coat slowly transitions to the adult black and white coat. And males that are the likely father of the infant act as protectors, and they work to keep the infant safe from other infanticidal males as well as predators. And these males do this really awesome display every morning where they leap through the trees, roaring extremely deeply, um, which it demonstrates their strength to females um, as well as to other males. And it's something that's just amazing to behold. Um, I'll talk about one species in South America. So the pied tamarind in Brazil is also on the top 25 most endangered list. Like other tamarinds and marmosets, these small monkeys have a really fascinating life history. So there's one dominant breeding female in the group, and she actually suppresses the reproduction of all the other females using pheromones, which are hormones distributed in the air. The breeding female gives birth to sets of twins, these really large babies. And so actually the twins are carried and cared for primarily by the males in the group, and they're only brought back to the mother to nurse so that she can reproduce again. So this species, has a fairly small geographic distribution in Brazil, and they live at really low population densities because they are aggressively territorial. So unfortunately for them, in the south part of their range, which should be a real stronghold, that's where the large city of Manaus is located. So these monkeys in the city are often electrocuted, captured for the pet trade, and attacked by people's pets. Also on the top 25 most endangered is one of my very favorite animals of all time, <laughs> the eye eye. So eye eyes are probably the most unique primate, the only living member of their genus Dobbintonia, a group of primates that went off on its own fascinating evolutionary path a long time ago. Eye eyes are the largest nocturnal primate and they have the largest brain of all the lemurs. They actually fill the niche of a woodpecker in Madagascar. So they're percussive hunters and they tap their way along the branches with their long fingers, and they listen with their independently mobile bat-like ears. And once they find a hollow filled with grubs, they chew into the bark with their incisor teeth, which continue to grow throughout their lives like a rodent. And then they use their one long chopstick-like finger <laughs> to dig the grubs out of the hole. And what's really, really cool is that the final digit of their finger is actually highly specialized with a ball and socket joint. So it actually can kind of helicopter around and pull the grubs right out of the hole. So eye eyes have very large home ranges and they live at really low densities. So it's really hard to determine how many are left, but they're suffering from habitat destruction and persecution because in some areas they're actually killed on site because they're thought to be a bad omen. And I'll just cover one more primate species here. Um, in Asia where so many primates are endangered, um, I'll talk about the Javan slow loris. Um, so all slow, slow lorises are threatened with extinction because of devastating habitat loss throughout their range. Um, and slow lorises are really unique in being the only venomous primate. They are one of actually only seven mammals that produces venom. So they mix oils from their brachial gland in their arm with their saliva, and this activates the venom, um, which they use to protect themselves from predators and in territorial battles. So besides habitat loss, these primates are greatly threatened by hunting for the pet trade and for traditional medicine. Um, so traditional medicine in the area uses whole dried loris bodies for various um, ailments. And the pet trade has been particularly devastating. Um, and also because the venom of lorises can actually cause anaphylactic shock and death in people, when these animals are taken for the pet trade, pet traders pull out their lower incisor teeth before selling them and packing them really tightly in boxes to be illegally transported. 
So here I'm showing you the global threats to primates and the percent of species affected. Um, and you might think that beyond giving to conservation organizations like Planet Madagascar, that there's not much you can do to help, but hopefully I'll convince you that's not totally true. Um, so you can actually alleviate some pressure on primate habitats caused by agriculture. And this is of course, because we live in a global world, right? Where crops and commodities are traded globally. And one of the largest contributors to habitat destruction is actually palm oil production in primate habitat countries. Now, palm oil is extremely useful and demand is growing and you can find it in many, many of the foods as cosmetics that you buy. And it goes by many names on the, on the back of the label. You might just see vegetable oil <laughs> or sodium laureth sulfate or cetyl alcohol. There's a list of about 20 different names that palm oil goes by. So it's hard to avoid. And indeed getting rid of palm oil production is not a great solution because you get the most oil per hectare of land with this type of crop. So it's extremely efficient. However, um, if you wanna help with this particular threat to primates, you can ensure that the products you buy are made by companies that use sustainable palm oil. So be to be officially sustainable, a company is pledging not to clear any primary forest, to have transparent supply chains, to limit their planting on peatlands, to treat workers fairly and to create wildlife zones in their plantations. Now you can also help with the second major threat to primates here, hunting and trapping. And that's again, because the illegal pet trade is also global and simply sharing cute videos of pet primates on social media can drive up demand for primates to be taken from the wild and put into the pet trade. And this threat can be really extreme because of a lot of secondary mortality. So what that means is that a lot of animals that are taken from the wild for the pet trade do not survive to ever be sold. In addition, in a lot of group living primates, a lot of the group will come down to protect and try to save the animal that's being taken for the pet trade. So typically the mother will die as well as other individuals in the group. So for one animal that ends up in the pet trade, you can have many animals die. So cute social media posts of pet primates not only drive up market demand, but they also give people the perception that these animals are not endangered. And finally, just briefly also with logging and wood harvesting, again, markets for wood and paper products are also global. So we may be buying wood and paper products from primate habitat countries um, where it's been logged illegally. Um, we also might be buying from companies that don't use proper environmental standards. So again, you know, a quick internet search, maybe not quick, you might have to investigate a bit, <laughs> um, can tell you whether the wood and paper products that you're buying are also sustainably sourced. And finally, I just wanna say, if you have the inclination, um, you should also get involved in primate field research. So there are many primate species where we don't even have basic natural history data. And how are we supposed to conserve a species if we don't know anything about them? In addition, it's been shown that long-term field sites where research has been ongoing for many years, are actually in better shape, the habitats are in better shape, and the primate species and the primate populations are in better shape than areas where there hasn't been long-term primate research going on or long-term research of any, of any type. So I can also promise you, if you get involved in field research, you'll see a lot of amazing things and you'll meet a lot of amazing people. So that's it for me. I'll pass back to Jesse here. Well, thank you so, so much, Julie, for such an amazing presentation. Uh, what a, a whirlwind tour of so many uh, threats and solutions facing primates around the world. So thank you so, so much for that. Um, all right, guys, we are going to dive in with questions now. So again, a huge thank you to Dr. Tykrobe, Dr. Herrera, Dr. Steffens for sharing their stories with us today about uh, their own experiences in the field and in helping protect wildlife around the globe. We do have a couple live groups. Some have had to go home. This is the end of their day here in Ontario. But I want to go to uh, Joe, who is our, our chief lemur lover in residence uh, over the last couple of weeks. So Joe is a student joining us in Mount Orb in Wisconsin. Joe, do you want to kick us off with a question? for our speakers today that they can answer? Sure. So what's your favorite lemur? Favorite lemur, guys. Okay, we're gonna bring them all in. James, Travis, and Julie, you have a favorite? <laughs> hmm. Definitely. Yeah, go for it. Tell us, uh, Julie, you wanna kick us off? Well, I have to go with the eye eye, you know? I can't, I can't go anywhere else. Fantastic. James, how about you? Yeah, I want to make sure everyone gets to see this. 
So remember which one it was. So I'll, let me uh, show you. This was the door flamer. The door flamer, which is uh, about the size of a squirrel. He's nocturnal, scurrying around up in the trees at night. And there's quite a few different species, but they're super cute. Nice. And Travis, what about you? <laughs> I, I, I have a few different favorites. Usually it's whatever lemur I'm looking at is my current favorite, but I... I definitely lean towards the Kokorel Shafaka, which many of you know as the Bumafu, and that's one of the species mm -hmm. I spent a long time working with in conservation and in research. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, quick note on Zabumafu, actually. So I wanted to do a quick plug. Uh, tonight, the Duke Lemur Center is hosting a virtual fundraiser instead of their, their typical one. It is free to register. And so I'm just going to bring up a quick banner uh, for you guys. Uh, the Duke Lemur Center Gala, you can check out their website there. Me, you, and Zabumafu, they're playing that. James is, is raising the roof for us. Uh, but you'll be attending <laughs> event at 8 p.m. tonight. If you want to follow up, if you've done our five sessions, do you want to do something else a little later tonight with your families? Uh, that would be a really, really cool event to check out. Awesome. All right. Uh, I want to go to Miss Carton's class, joining us all the way in Anchorage, Alaska. It's been a long time since I've seen Miss Carton. This is really exciting. So if you want to demute your microphone, come on in. I know your video is not on right now, but if you have a question for us, go for it. Absolutely. Yeah, we are connecting through Zoom, um, so it won't let us do our video. But so we, I am screen share screen sharing with my students. So my co-host teacher, do you have a blue hand that's up of a student who wants to ask a question? Uh, Ms. Cargish's class, do you have any questions? Raise your blue hand if you want to ask our scientists anything. And then Miss Remind's Bye. class, that's also visiting. You're welcome. Yeah. So who we got? If we get more than the one while you guys are waiting to, you can always type them to me in the chat bar, Ms. Carton, and then I'll pass them along as we continue on with the broadcast. Perfect. All right. All right. McKinley has a question. All right, McKinley, go ahead and ask your question. Sure. What is the most extinct animal? The most like, extinct animal. <laughs> most like endangered animal. Like yeah. I think we'll stay with most endangered. Is there one that's particularly under threat that we could really work towards conserving, guys? James, I think you know the, I think you worked with the most endangered lemur, don't no? you? know, it's it's like uh, Julie mentioned uh, with those meetings every two years where everybody just gets in a room and fights over whose species is more endangered. But the silky shafaka is definitely up there. I, I see that the lepa lemur septentrionalis, which is a sportive lemur from way up in the north, there's like just one little pocket of forest that it's known from. So that's really endangered too. One of the mouse lemurs, the Madame Berth's mouse lemurs. Yeah. Um, it's something that, I mean, like the fact that we have to ask this question, what's the most endangered lemur? I mean, these are a really threatened group of animals in the entire world, like the most threatened group of animals in the world. It's something we've been talking about all day, which is why conservation efforts are so important now. So I actually, I, I want to take a, a quick note out uh, even hosted by the Toronto Zoo today. And so I know the Duke Lemur Center, the Toronto Zoo both have live lemurs on site. Uh, zoos in a lot of people's minds are, are places where animals are in captivity, uh, but they're, they're really have shifted their, their focus and their efforts in the last few years to really become major conservation hubs. Can you guys speak to the role of zoos or places where lemurs are kept live um, as a conservation tool? James, if you want to kick us off? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, as uh, the DLC often says, the animals here in captivity are kind of like a, an insurance policy or a safety net. You know, if, if something catastrophic were to happen in Madagascar, there'd still be animals here that maybe could restock. And in the, the populations in Madagascar, and in fact, some of the lemurs that were bred here at Duke were returned to the wild in Madagascar successfully. So it, it is possible that in the future, you know, the breeding efforts here will go back to Madagascar. But of course, you know, the DLC Sava conservation program, program wouldn't happen in Madagascar if we didn't have the lemur colony here, uh, which is how we get so many people interested and passionate about the lemurs. So yeah, the, the role of uh, zoos and, and research facilities, primate facilities like this are, are really important for conservation. Fantastic, thank you, James. Julia, uh, Travis, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I guess uh, I would add that I think zoos are really important for getting, especially kids who can't see these animals, you know, in real life, except at zoos. I think they're really important for getting, um, getting people passionate about animal conservation and, you know, starting to really, really love the animals and, and wonder how their um, wild populations are doing. 
Absolutely. I mean, as a kid myself, getting to go to the Toronto Zoo here in Toronto, it was a hugely impactful experience for me, getting to see Steve Irwin, David Attenborough on television, uh, and all the amazing wildlife that they showcased uh, was my, my formative influence. So, yeah, to add before we go to another question? Travis? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's difficult for me to hear, but yes, the uh, zoos, are, zoos are amazing. Uh, I wouldn't be studying lemurs uh, or, or primates if I, if I didn't have uh, access to where I grew up uh, having a great zoo was the Calgary Zoo. And without, uh, just like James said, without the help from the Toronto Zoo, there would be, we would have uh, people in Madagascar wouldn't have the same jobs that they have now. So we have people employed by funds that come directly from the Toronto Zoo. So there's a really important component I think zoos play in, in both education and conservation and research as well, as a lot of zoos are involved with research uh, 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 as well as conservation and education. Fantastic, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I want to stress, too, if you, if you don't have a zoo near you, one of the ways you can get involved in seeing animals in the wild, follow up in this conversation with conservation generally, shameless plug for my hero. Uh, on Netflix, it's a zoo, like, uh, available to a lot of kids. A Life on Our Planet, Netflix, fairly recent series, an incredible series to highlight a lot of solutions for conservation. So I encourage you guys to check that out if you get a chance as well. Uh, you, know, you talked about something uh, briefly, and James, you touched upon it as well. Uh, ecotourism, so bringing people live to Madagascar, to these places to take part. Uh, for all three of you, I know your, your organizations are as uh, individuals in the field. Uh, you've had a chance to talk about this. Um, for, uh, as a tool for conservation, what can ecotourism do and what's being done in Madagascar to bring people to your sites and see what you're doing firsthand? Um, Julie, do you want to kick us off? Go for it. Uh, sure. I'm not sure um, how ecotourism in Madagascar is going, but ecotourism has been incredibly important in the conservation of some um, primate species in Africa that I know about where um, people are really invested in keeping the population safe um, and in not cutting down the forests because they know that tourists come regularly to come see these animals and that brings in a lot of um, a lot of money that they wouldn't have access to. So for instance, the Boabing Fema Monkey Sanctuary that I talked about, where I did my research um, for my graduate work, um, the monkeys were originally sacred and they are to some degree still, um, but Western religion has really taken over in the area. And um, what really keeps the monkeys safe now is no, no longer the fact that they are thought to be children of the gods, is more actually that um, Boabing Fema is now the top tourist destination in Ghana and it brings in a lot of money. Um, but there's a there's some drawback, right? That there's a lot of wear and tear on the site, um, and um, you know, the numbers of people that see the animals um, sometimes have to be limited. The distance that they get to the animals should be limited, um, but otherwise, it can be a really important conservation tool. Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, individual story. I was going to mention gorillas in Rwanda, in the Congo, and Uganda, as being a really uh, amazing conservation story, driving a lot of tourism there. Costa Rica, we covered before. Like a lap ago, it's another great example. Uh, so thank you, Julie. Uh, Travis, do you want to talk about Planet Madagascar and ecotourism before we go to James? Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I've worked in tourism for about 15 years. In fact, it's how I paid for grad school um, to get into do my PhD. Um, and I've always been interested in finding ways to make tourism work. But um, we actually don't incorporate a lot of ecotourism in Madagascar where I work. Although there is ecotourism in the area, in the small communities where I work, uh, tourism, it's just they're too far from the from the from the infrastructure that's needed to support tourists. And I didn't want to create a scenario where the communities were reliant on tourism, which can often be quite fickle, um, as we're seeing now during a COVID crisis. There is no tourism going to these places anymore. And so I think tourism is extremely important for conservation and it's spe under specific circumstances. But it's not a panacea to solve uh, conservation crises around the world. It's it's a component to to augment or support other conservation initiatives. That was a very thoughtful answer, and you incorporate a panacea into a conversation, which does not happen very often. So thank you, Travis. Um, James, do you have any thoughts about Duke Lemur Center and, and conservation either in North Carolina or in the Savo region? Well, absolutely. Yeah, the Duke Lemur Center here has, uh, you know, we get thousands of, of visitors every year. And so it's been really difficult now with COVID. Um, but as you've, uh, as you've been seeing the education staff here, especially Megan, have really helped to uh, 
to get all of our um, information online so we can share it still virtually. But tourism is very important here in Durham is, and, and in Madagascar. It was one of the leading sources of revenue coming into the country, you know, before the before COVID and the lockdowns, you know, ever since until very recently, there's there's been no tourism and hotels and restaurants and things like that have had to close their doors. Uh, people who made livings as tourist guides before, you know, they they have to turn to other means for, for income. And that often means, you know, going to farming and things like that, that, you know, they, they really took advantage of those opportunities, not just to make money and have tourists, but to explain and, and the value of, of uh, the biodiversity in Madagascar for people from all over the world, including local tourists, you know, because local tourism is really important for Malagasy folks, especially in the cities, to get out into nature and see the biodiversity in their country. And, you know, with the parks closed, they're closed to everyone. So it means that even the local folks don't have access to their national parks. And um, it's, it's a big source of revenue, but as Travis mentioned, because of the the uh, volatility in that um, in that source of revenue, it, it can be really hard because when you have a crisis or a crash like this, you know that that's where having a diversified kit really helps, like what Travis is describing. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, James. All right, I love this question. We'll take it as our second last question. It's coming in from Alaska. James, you can kick us off with an answer. We'll just go in reverse order. Um, this is from Alaska from our Anchorage class. What made you also interested in lemurs and conservation? Like, what drove you to this? You guys are so passionate. You're dripping with enthusiasm for this. Uh, James, do you want to kick us off? Go for it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you took that one. I saw that in the chat, and that's one of my kind of favorite topics. And I'm glad that Travis mentioned his uh, history with the zoos as well. So I got my start and my interest in primates as a, a zookeeper at Monkey Jungle. Shout out to Monkey Jungle down in South Florida and the Dumont Conservancy, where I had opportunities to get exposure to primates, learn about how fascinating they are and their conservation. And then I had a really cool opportunity that my undergraduate advisor, Linda Taylor, told me about, which was a study abroad program in Madagascar with Pat Wright. And once I went, I was uh, addicted. I, I loved it and I really wanted to do my PhD there. And luckily, Pat Wright, who was the advisor, took me on as a student and I never looked back. <laughs> awesome, thanks, James. Travis, how about you? Yeah, so when I was eight years old, I was convinced that I was going to grow up and become a monkey. Um, when I learned that that wasn't possible, I, uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll study monkeys then. And seeing them at the Calgary Zoo got me really excited. But I was really just quite lucky because the University of Calgary uh, had, a, had a fantastic and still does a fantastic program in primatology. So I fell into to studying primates. Um, through that program. It's, uh, I got my undergrad and master's. In fact, um, Julie was my TA at one point. Um, and then the, uh, I, I was really interested in where, where monkeys and, and primates were and why they were there, but in the context of humans impacting their environment. And the best place to do that would be Madagascar. It didn't hurt that they had things called injuries and eye eyes and shifakas because those things seem so strange. I had to go visit that country just to see what something with a name like that would look like. So I, I fell into it out of pure just interest and curiosity, but also it's one of the best places. Lemurs are some of the best species to study uh, habitat loss and disturbance. Yeah. Outstanding. Thanks, Travis. Um, Julie, before you answer, how was Travis as a student when you were a TA? I just I, he talked a lot, you know. <laughs> uh, but yes, what's your personal story? I'd love to hear it. Uh, sure. Well, I was one of those weird kids that always just wanted to watch animals and, and be in the forest and not do anything else. And so I would watch pretty much any animal. And I thought, well, you know, I want to do this for a living, but people don't do this, do they, for a living? So I went into a veterinary program. And I hated it. I hated every moment of it. <laughs> and so I didn't exactly know where people studied animal behavior, but I saw that in my zoology courses, it wasn't till like the fifth year of my undergrad. Didn't know if I could hang out that long. So I going through, you know, despondently going through the, the university calendar and I saw this this place, this discipline called anthropology where there was a whole bunch of primate behavior courses. And so for my very first one, very first class of my very first primate behavior course, I was like, ding, 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 because it's really this social behavior that really uh, excites me. And primates are incredibly social and incredibly complicated um, in terms of their sociality. So 
um, I never looked back after that. Awesome. I love the diverse stories and the similarities between them. Uh, again, you guys are so passionate. We really appreciate you all being there. And these are, are, are fantastic tales to inspire kids to seek out their own passions and get excited about wildlife and conservation themselves. And so that actually is a nice segue into our last question before we do our wrap up today. And that is what can kids do at home? I'm going to leave you all on the screen so you can sort of rip off each other. If I'm a kid in Alaska, Ontario, or around the world, Wisconsin, what can I do right now? And Julie, you touched upon this a lot, but what can I do right now? to help conserve lemurs and conserve climate and species around the world. Ah, uh, who wants to go first? James, go first, by fruit. <laughs> no, I think Julie should go first. She really touched on everything that I wish I said. <laughs> go for it. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, if I had, if I had uh, a lot of, uh, young enthusiasm going on, I would really investigate the, the palm oil uh, situation and the palm oil problem and, you know, get to know the companies that are um, using sustainable palm oil and those that aren't, and then maybe uh, be a pest and pester the companies that don't use sustainable palm oil a little bit um, with your uh, internet skills. Awesome. So Paul is something that's been brought up in a lot of our programs, actually. So I'm really glad we touched upon that today. Um, again, if you see the scale of the devastation, so to speak, in, in Borneo and other places in Southeast Asia, it's quite incredible. It's something that's also touched upon in that Netflix documentary that I've shared. Um, James, Travis, either one, what can kids do? Yeah, so the um, I'll, 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 I'll bite the... One of the main things that you can do, and so we've talked about this a few times in, in, in the Lemur Awareness Day, is awareness itself. Um, the actions that Julie uh, are talking about are amazing. And I think by gaining awareness about understanding about palm oil or awareness about what a lemur is, why should we care about these things? Well, they're related to us. They're our relatives. You know, understanding that, learning more about other primates. You know, losing a primate species, we lose a piece of our shared evolutionary history. Uh, uh, Alejandro Estrada and colleagues published a paper a few years ago and suggested that if primates can no longer live on this planet, then where can people live if we are also a primate? So it's something to think about. So if you want to think about how to protect these animals, think about how to live more sustainably in a, pli uh, in a planet where you have to share it with, with relatives that, uh, that look like monkeys and lemurs. Uh, that is a beautiful message. Thank you, Travis. Uh, James, you have the last word, and then you want to share with us <laughs> after those two. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, just just echoing both of what they say. You know, we feel like these places are so far away, and yet because of the globalization, you know, the, the products that we rely on every day, including the laptop I'm looking at you all with, you know, these materials come from places like the Congo and Madagascar and, and uh, Southeast Asia and, and South America. You know, the palm oil is definitely one. And I think that young people are so much better at things like social media and getting the word out there than I am, that even just by like finding those companies and sharing it with your network, which is so well connected with other networks, you can really get the word out there. I mean, I would just add to this list um, mica, which is a very poorly known mineral for most people. And actually it's in almost all the cosmetics that are out there. That's another mineral that, you know, recent news came out about some really unsustainable mica mining in Madagascar, child labor and scary things like that. You know, women and children getting very, very little money to put their lives at risk. So mica is another one. Check your L'Oreal MAC products, see where they get their ma uh, mica from. Rosewood is is uh, uh, another one that's it's a type of really dark, beautiful wood, but it's an endangered species. It's actually more heavily trafficked than ivory or rhino horns. And so, you know, it's mostly going to places like China, but even American guitar companies were um, found, you know, buying illegal Madagascar um, rosewood at a time, you know, more than 10 years ago. But still keeping and keeping track of those kinds of products. And then, of course, just spreading the word. Yeah. Um, I love that we've covered so much here. I'm really happy that this conversation took a turn to choosing sustainable products. Uh, this is something that a lot of classrooms, a lot of people don't think about. We really got a chance to touch upon it today. 
donate to conservation organizations. Uh, none of our, our speakers today really highlighted this, but in Madagascar, money goes a really long way in helping uh, support uh, local community, local people. Travis, you mentioned this with Jean Paul's example in the Toronto Zoo. Uh, so uh, there are lots of ways to take part, learn more, get educated, find out about the products that you use in your everyday life and make sustainable places. Thank you so, so much to all our speakers. Um, this has been a really, really insightful, fantastic discussion. I really appreciate you all joining me today. Awesome, guys. Um, what I want to do too, uh, before we wrap up here, is again mention that this session is a joint effort of a bunch of amazing organizations, University of Toronto Scarborough Campus, the Toronto Zoo, Planet Madagascar, and the Duke Lemur Centre, all of which almost fit on one banner there, but not quite. That's how many there are. Um, I want to turn it over to Bernie Kratz. He is from the University of Toronto Scarborough Campus to wrap us up today and say a final farewell message, and then we will wrap it up from there. So Bernie, thank you so much for coming in to join us today. And uh, go for it. Yeah, thank you very much. I see this is a really high energy event and I love learning about uh, lemurs and, and other primates. So first of all, the speakers and panelists uh, from, uh, from Toronto, from, from Guelph, as well as from uh, the New England Primate Conservancy. Uh, so Julian, Travel, James, thank you very much. This was fully informative. And I love having you kick off our uh, Toronto Zoo, University of Toronto Scarborough discussion series. But I also wanted to extend my thanks to the audience, uh, especially from faraway places like Alaska, for attending and making this such a successful event. Now, you've heard repeatedly that this is Zoom Awareness Day, and I'm really saddened to learn that a staggering 99% of lemurs are endangered and about 30% are critically endangered. And for the most part, this is the result of human activity resulting in loss of habitat. That is a staggering number and losing these animals, as was said earlier today, is, is really that we are losing a piece of our own history. Zoos around the world play a key role in animal conservation. And whether it's lemurs or more closely here in Toronto, blanding turtles. Zoos play a vital role also in research and outreach, and thereby contributing to our knowledge of animals and plants and how we can best preserve our very fragile environment. Our collaborations between the Toronto Zoo and the University of Toronto Scarborough is a unique opportunity for our students and researchers to study issues related to environmental conservation, as well as animal breeding. These and many other activities we engage in allow our institutions to draw attention to conservation and, uh, and, and highlight the importance of studying living systems, practicing sustainable agricultural uh, practices, and, uh, and it demonstrates and, and allows us to study how we as humans interfere with the natural habitat around the world. And today we heard beautiful examples uh, from, uh, from, our, from our panelists. The University of Toronto Scarborough and the Toronto Zoo continue to uh, work together to identify opportunities for collaborations that are of mutual interest as we navigate these very difficult times. And our efforts are an example of these uh, synergies that come from co cross institutional activities that bring together individuals from very diverse backgrounds to generate cutting edge opportunities, research opportunities right here in the Eastern GTA. Now, again, I want to thank all of you for participating. This was just the first uh, of a, 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 a number of panel discussions uh, that, will, uh, that will bring specialists together right here on YouTube and on GTA. And I'm looking forward to our next panel discussion. And please stay tuned for details. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernie. I'm personally so excited about this. I'm so glad you're collaborating with the zoo, two of the organizations, and uh, thank you so, so much for joining today. So what we'll do now, everyone, uh, again, today's sessions have had 1,250 plus kids from, I think, 10 US states, four Canadian provinces, internationally, all take part, five incredible programs. Just a quick reminder, I'll bring them up for you all again. We kicked off the day with Planet Madagascar live in Madagascar. We talked to Dr. Carrie Ann McGugan for Chasing Lemurs, her incredible tale of her own adventures in Northwestern Madagascar, to the Duke Lemur Center for the Lemur Forest, highlighting their amazing species, uh, to the Toronto Zoo with Dr. Steffens and Sonia, the lemur keeper at the zoo, highlighting all the cool ringtail lemurs they have, and of course, wrapping up with today's really exciting panel. So thank you so, so much to absolutely everyone for taking involved. 
whew, I'm going to leave now and go help and serve some lemurs. I'm going to bring in Julie, James, and Travis to say a quick goodbye as well. So come on in, everyone. Thank you so, so much again, and have a wonderful rest of your day, guys.